Dane and Derek is an uncensored, unfiltered podcast. You can find content warnings in the episode description. Thank you for listening. Hello, hello, everybody. Good morning, and welcome back to our little corner of the internet. My name is Derek, and this is the Dane and Derek Show, where we talk about art, Dungeons and Dragons, life, and ma. And with me, as always, is Dane. Hey, I'm Dane. I'm a writer, law student, uh, lover of tabletop RPGs, which is going to be relevant today. Um, and I love a bunch of other stuff. Music, art, movies, stuff. It's yeah, all good. Life. Yeah. Life in general. Yeah. Life in general. So how how badly do you think we're going to blow through our one minute um, uh, limit that we set for ourselves for our updates today? I think it's going to be pretty bad. Yeah. yeah but that's fair. at the same time, because it's been... I think it's only been a week or two weeks since last we actually recorded, but I feel like there's always stuff happening. So true. Absolutely yeah. true. Why don't we enter the danger zone All right. uh, for the law and school update? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, okay. So uh, as of recording this, I mean, again, I'm never quite sure when a lot of these episodes air. So like I could be, uh, this could be months from now or like a month and a half. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but long and long and short of it is, uh, I finished finals yesterday. Um, which means, thank you. Which means more or less like one year of law school done, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it, I, I, I don't remember exactly who I was saying this to, but, it has been the fastest, longest year I've experienced in a really, really long time. Mm. Um, you know, like right now I look back and I'm like, when did a whole year of law school happen? I don't remember that. And simultaneously I'm like, oh my God, this year has never, it's just so, so long. There's so much that's happened, which I actually prefer. Like that is kind of the sweet spot, right? For me yeah. at least. Um, cause it means, it means you're learning a lot. There's a lot new things happening. You're, you're taking in a lot. Um, but also it's not a, s- well, it has been a slog, but, um, <laughs> it has been engaging and it has kept me on my toes and that's been, that's been great. So finals are done. Um, those three, four ish counting the, the paper, uh, super kicked my ass, but, um, I'm here. I'm through to the other side. I start work in two days. Um, (laughs) Counting today, I get three days off. Wow. Um, Yeah. Well, dang, man. I'm looking forward to hearing how the job goes. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Me too. I am looking forward to to knowing how the job goes. <laughs> um, I've been really looking forward to it. Um, I'm I'm working as a clerk for a local law firm, which. I have been really desperate to start doing anything more practical. Like, um, it's just, it's just been so theoretical and, um, yeah, yeah, it's just time to, it's time to do some, some of the real work. But what about you? What's the, uh, that was pretty good. Yeah. That was was like, it was like, it was like a minute and a half too. Yeah. You did great. You did really great. Um, man, I'm trying to think. I think the last update was that I had just found a producer for my, for the doc that I'm working on. Right. Yes. I think so. Um, man, uh, I think, I mean, we're in the thick of production. Mm -hmm. Um, that's probably been what's on my mind lately. And I've just been working through a lot of budgets and, starting to organize all of the footage and thinking about post-production and thinking about what me one year from now will be upset with Derek right now if I don't do it right now in terms of organizing and staying organized. Mm -hmm. Um, And a big part of that has led to me watching a lot of uh, workflow videos from just various filmmakers and YouTubers and like talking to friends in the post-production world. Mm -hmm. And just kind of seeing how other people do it and like seeing what I can, you know, learn from each person. Uh, And then also I've been 
for the first time in maybe a decade, I've been considering learning a new tool Ooh. to edit. Yeah. Um, I've been editing with Adobe products for the last 10 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I'm considering learning Final Cut Pro 10. Classic. Yep. I've been, every time I go to the Apple store, I basically sit down and I spend like 45 minutes to an hour in the Apple store just playing with Final Cut. And there are a handful of features that I feel are going to make my life much easier for editing this doc because at the moment it's looking like I'm going to be doing most of the editing myself, which means that I need to make sure that I'm organized and comfortable in the software. And there's a part of me that like knows how lazy I can get within Adobe. Mm -hmm. And there's a few features in Final Cut that make grouping clips easier, like the way that it links clips together, you can move a stack of clips around much faster, hmm. um, which which I didn't expect to really enjoy. And um, it's just a bit more of a complete program, and it's one program. It's not a subscription. And, true, true, um, true, true. Yeah, and like that's been, I, I think, the, the thing I've been really contemplating, um, but it's scary to learn a new program. Uh, it's scary to learn a new tool. But I think sometimes the best place to learn a new tool is on the job, <laughs> um, which kind of ties back into yours of getting like practical trial experience. by fire. Yeah, trial, trial by, by fire. fire. Um, so yeah, that's my film update. Nice, nice. Yeah. That was pretty good too. That yeah. was like two or three minutes. Yep. Yeah, we did good it. Job. We, yeah, we we did a good job. Okay, yeah, it was nice and. We, yeah, good job, us. We should bet on ourselves more. <laughs> <laughs> we still went over. Um, <laughs> well. Tell me about your idea for today's topic, which is um, it's either, it's like the best tabletop role playing games that are D and D, or in parentheses like top three. So I'm, I'm really yeah. curious, like what you meant by that. Top three. So uh, there's there's two ways to look at this, and I don't know how much prep you did on this. I don't really need to do a lot of prep because I, I my prep was running a weird indie. Uh, tabletop RPG podcast for four or five years. So like these just <laughs> sort of sit in my brain. Yeah. Um, so there's like two answers to this, right? Like um, what are the best tabletop RPGs that are trying to replace D and D? So that's your stuff. Like that's your five torches deep. That's your old school essentials. That's your where it's, it's D and D, but not five E and not wizards. Right. Yeah. Um, or there's the, what are the best tabletop RPGs that just are not D and D period. Um, both like mechanically, like setting wise, just very far from that. Um, mm. and so like, you feel free to answer whichever of those versions of the questions question you want to answer. I'm going to answer the latter one, the one about, uh, games that are just absolutely not D and D, but are still tabletop role playing games. Yeah. I, I think I would like to answer that one too, because I feel like the, the former question is something we've talked about a lot just in general with OSRs mm -hmm. and games like Dungeon World and stuff like that on the show. Absolutely. And so I feel like we haven't touched on that latter question. So mm -hmm. let's dig into that because, I mean, I, I, I'm i very lucky to have a lot of friends that play a lot of tabletop role playing games. And so mm -hmm. and I'm very lucky to uh, be easily swayed into going on Kickstarter and supporting games. Um, so I have a lot of tabletop games on my shelf and on my computer that I can open up right now and mm -hmm. peruse to get ideas while you speak. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm happy to go first. So yeah. do we want to do our classic back and forth? One, one, one. Um, no, I'd need... say go all three, go, go all, all three. three all right. Yeah. Okay. So first one I'm going to do, um, is this is probably as close to D and D as I'm going to get. Um, because it the, the the mechanics are just a little bit closer because the mechanics are roll dice in relationship to a sort of stat. Mm -hmm. um, but I would I would say that this would be um, Beam Saber is mm. probably the one I would like to talk about here. Oh man, the, this is tough. I may end up needing to do four. I'm going to talk about Beam Saber real fast. Beam Saber is a forged in the dark game. So it's it's based off of uh, Blades in the Dark. However, it is about mainly mech combat, but actually it's it's just 
uh, people in a, a vehicle. Um, so when I played it, it was with like starfighters. Uh, and, and the thing that I like so much about it is that it actually makes uh, it very manageable to basically run two character sheets at once. Um, because hmm. you need to run because you have a character that's like a person and then you have your machine and mm-hmm. the machine is like a mini sheet within your sheet. So it's, it's just very cool that they, that, that was pulled off that way. However, the thing that I really like about it is that it is based around sort of set success ranges and clocks, um, as opposed to hit points, stats, uh, rolling to hit, you can essentially solve any problem you want to, however you would do it narratively um Mm -hmm. and it ticks down a clock such that like you know like if you get into a fight with somebody and you start off by using your like fighting skill to like start dealing with that combat but then you switch over to your like uh your talking skill to um to finish it like you finish that like clock up up with with like an impassioned plea that is an absolutely acceptable way to deal with a problem um so and and it's party based uh, um it's particularly party based um and and so like it's kind of like this like transition game i'm going to talk about here where it's um it kind of is in between um the games i'm about to talk to talk about and Mm. Um, D and D in the sense of like the dice are definitely there and they make a huge, huge difference. Um, but despite how garbage I think the character sheets typically are in fortune of the dark games, granted I did praise the fact that it managed to do two characters on a single sheet, which impressive still kind of a mess. It's actually really unclear how to use a lot of it. Um, Mm. when it all clicks together, great but you have to reach that point and it's, it's very dense. Um, yeah. Biggest biggest complaint there. Um, but setting all that aside, beam saber is just particularly, um, flexible and it's just not set like D and D and it just doesn't feel like it in as much as a lot of games like uh, dungeon world or even plays in the dark do just because it not only combines, more abstract mechanics with a very different setting. Um, and it's also really hard to fall back on D and D, uh, isms like it is in like blades in the dark. Like you can very easily in blades in the dark be like, we're going dungeon crawling because we can. Whereas with this, it's like, well, what are we going to do with our max? Um, You're not going dungeon crawling, you know, like it just, it, it, it forces you in different, um, play and narrative spaces. So that's that. Gotcha. Um, taking the next leap, I'm going to talk about two ish games at once. Um, and that will be dust of the traveled road and fall of magic. Mm. And the reason I'm talking about these two games at once is because the mechanic of both of these games basically is a map. Um, the point of the game is you have a map in front of you, everybody kind of, and everybody creates a character based off of some very loose archetypes, um, in fall of magic. It's things like the crow of Raven hall or whatever. Like it's that vague, like that's Uh it. Um, like maybe you get a trait. Um, and it's a little more intense in, I I say intense in dust of the traveled road in which you either basically pick warrior warrior thief or uh, um warrior expert mage basically but you get to do halvesies so you can do like double warrior or you can do warrior mage or and like the order matters and all of that um but that's it like otherwise that is that is it and otherwise what you do is you and your your play group there's no gm um you go from point on the map to point on the map following a dotted line. You can make different like branching choices, all, all of that good stuff. Um, and at each place there's prompts and typically there are smaller sub prompts and you just do scenes. Um, there are some light mechanics in both. Um, there's some, uh, there's some trait rules in, um, fall of magic and in dust of the traveled road. On the other hand, um, certain scenes are locked out 
-hmm. based on class requirements, essentially. So -hmm. there's some scenes you cannot do unless you are at least part warrior or double warrior. And sometimes you can combine with a fellow player and like, so long as you're both in the scene, you will both meet the requirements, but sometimes you can't. Um, and so like both of these games just enable uh, the long journey style storytelling. And they both have like some narrative frames built in around them. Uh, Fall of Magics are a little bit stronger than Dust of the Traveled Roads. Um, but it's it just leads to this improv- improvisational, like very beautiful um storytelling style it's not combative there's no leveling up goals it's the only goal is to tell this sort of story and the games really reinforce that and even though both of these games are fantasy games specifically down to like some of the sort there's sort of like a class system it does not feel like D D at all outside of the fact that both are sort of fantasy-esque that's it um because in D&D, there's this constant strategy. There's this constant like, okay, are we going to get into a fight? Like, what are my powers? How do I like up my strength? And in these, it's like, well, how do I resolve this character's trauma? You know, like it's a very different, <laughs> it's a very different like uh, a, a mindset to be in. Um, because the goal is not to roll well or do fun combos not that those things are bad at all love doing that i am a power gamer um but yeah. what it is is it just it changes it because the the thing is you are constantly trying to have the most interesting scenes both with your fellow players and as entertainment for your fellow players the the goal is shifted right um uh-huh. and because they're gmless you need to be managing um, you need to be group managing the game. No one is going to um, cut you off. You know, like sometimes a good GM when there's like scenes happening in more like traditional, like I don't even traditional feels like the wrong word in, in, in more D and D like games will be like, all right, so let's bring this scene to a close, right? Like there's a, they almost take sometimes take on a di- directorial role of like not letting things go too far. Right. But if you're in the, these other settings, you have to be in this like situation in this headspace of like, not only are you in your scene, you need to man You need to kind of have a sense of like, how long have we been going? You know what? We probably need to like wind this down because we've been going for about five minutes and half the party's not in this scene. So, um, entertainment value aside gotcha. there's a, there's a limit and we need to like manage it and so it's um it's kind of magical for the fact that it is so much more like improv and so much less like a board game mm. if that makes sense like if there's a spectrum that tabletop rpgs kind of like wishy-washy sit between role-playing game or not role play, uh, like board hardcore board games with like very little story like somewhere between like chess or risk and on the other hand you've got like we're an improv troupe you know (laughs) um this is way further on the improv side um and these games are just really beautiful i would encourage everybody to look up dust of the traveled road um and fall of magic they're extremely beautiful games in and of themselves um last one uh and this is arguably maybe my favorite tabletop rpg of all time um, and it is called Our Mundane Supernatural Life. I've probably told you about it before. Um, and in this game, it's for two players only, um, I believe. Uh, they, they, they've done some expansions with it, so they may actually support more than one now. But but the point is, one of you plays a like normal human, and the other one plays a supernatural being. That could be a vampire, a ghost, a... Um, a, a weird like kami spirit god thing you know like a werewolf um and you set up a, a day together you let you play out a single day together in which there is a supernatural problem and a very mundane problem and the two people are in relationship with each other um the default implication is a romantic, semi-romantic relationship, but not necessarily. It could be parent-child relationship, um, friends, um, etc. But you need to be in 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 like meaningful and deep-rooted 
relationship to each other. And the point is to play out a difficult day in which um, these two problems conflict. So like their, their, their most like straightforward example is it's the night of the full moon, but we, and I am a werewolf, but we also must go to parent teacher conferences, Um, (laughs) you know? And so it, the way it works is, is you, you write out like scenes that are, some of them are shared, some of them are not um, on cards with times of day, you set them in order and you um, secretly put X's on some of them. The Mm -hmm. X's mean that something goes wrong in the scene. Um, And again, this is extremely improvisational. You roll a die to see how long the scene is um, time-wise. So, you know, like you roll and it's like, okay, the scene is four minutes long and then you go and you just play the scene out. Um, If it's a solo scene where one of the other protagonists isn't, the other protagonist isn't in it, like the other person takes on non-player characters, et cetera. And it is... I don't know how else to say it, but it's just like, it is a studio Ghibli movie making machine. Like, I don't know how it's, it's just amazing like that. Like uh, it just hits all of those notes so Mm. hard of just like, it's magical and strange and funny and sweet, occasionally kind of heart wrenching and something absolutely wild will definitely happen. And yet it is actually all about these very small, so human things. It's great. I would so recommend this game. And it is, again, nothing like d d It just it just isn't. It's not you're not going to be rolling dice. You don't have stats. It's not even like Dust of the Travel Road where you have like classes or like Fall of Magic where there are titles you know mm-hmm. you're you just have the character you create together um when i played it with um with with my friend natalie um we to help us do like character creation we made a shared playlist twice um to help us figure out these characters from scratch um and it was it genuinely really wonderful um, game and it doesn't feel like it can be the sort of game in which there's more than one session play but actually i think you can because natalie and i did it um it's we we played one game and then two years later we played another with the same characters years later in their lives um mm. and that was also fucking magical so lots going on with that game um and i think one thing to to understand about tabletop rpgs that i think sometimes we don't understand is that tabletop rpgs should not be seen at you you should i don't think anyone should be looking for the universal tabletop rpg i mm-hmm. think that's a that you're going to be really disappointed um by that um because a lot of the a lot of the strengths of tabletop rpgs are when they actually focus in a little bit and work on the genre area style that they really want to and kick ass at it our mundane supernatural life will not help you tell any sort of dungeon crawly story that is feels anything like a D one D and D cannot do what our mundane supernatural life does. I will say some games are more flexible. I think five E dungeon world in particular are both pretty flexible in the sense of like, I think you can run the gamut from like spell jammer all the way to, you know, a Conan, the barbarian, barely any magic, you know, kind of a more game of Thrones style fantasy, yes. but there's a limit there. That's, that's, that's the width. And that's a pretty wide band. Good for D and D. Um, but I will also say there are other games out there that will probably do both of those things better. Um, and so like what, what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is like these games I've, I've pitched at you are very specific. Um, they have some flexibility and range. They do not have as much as even 5e does though. I would also argue that 5e dilutes itself a little bit to be able to do that. That is, that is the downside of being, uh, flexible right 
Um, yeah, that that's the most difficult part about any tabletop game is like, if you want, there are games that appeal to a broad experience, and then games that appeal to a specific experience, mm-hmm. and um, and of course everything in between. But some of the bigger games, some of the more D and D adjacent or D and D style of games, um they definitely lend itself to a broader audience than the more specific kind of experience that um, some of these games definitely lean towards. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like these games nail something like they nail the thing they nail, they do, but that's all Mm -hmm. they do. And um, I, I would advocate for more of those games. Um, But I also understand that like, it's a very specific thing to want to do because the, uh, these games don't really, they they typically don't support super long-term play. And I think part of the appeal of something like a 5e is like, we're going to play this campaign for a while. You know, you're going to come every week, every other week, whatever. And you're going to know what you're going to do. You're doing when you sit down. You know, like there's no like there's no rule learning time. There's just we're just going to sit down and start. And it's there's something to that, too. So I don't want to I don't want to take that from anybody. But right. Yeah. Yeah. I have talked for 15, (laughs) 20 minutes straight. What's up? Your turn. (laughs) Yeah, my turn. Like, I think to that. Right. I think anyone that plays tabletop games long enough eventually has a desire to try something new, I think. And. Mm -hmm. You know, there's definitely people that are like, oh, yeah, all I ever do is buy tabletop games, but I only ever just play D&D. And that is certainly like a vibe, but I certainly feel like um, there's definitely room to explore and experiment because like Mm -hmm. you might find that like maybe the reason why like D&D experiences always felt meh was because you like smaller games or maybe like smaller games are great breaks in between longer games like. I don't play nearly as many smaller games as you do. Um, but actually lately well, since the podcast, I right. don't do that much anymore. Right. Continue. That 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 was going to be the thing I was going to say like as of late it's definitely flipped. I haven't been playing much of anything at all. Period, but um and I know and I know you've been having a D&D renaissance mm-hmm. um which is wild to imagine um considering that for so long you were the indie game guy. Uh Yep. But I think like to that point, right? It's like sometimes different seasons require different games, um, which, you know, to that end, right? I think like um, the three games that I'm about to mention are three games that I think, I don't know. I found them to be, I, I would say they're significant to me in terms of the games I played. The first one is... Um, quest which is D kind of um it's a less like D and it's less like dungeon world and yeah yeah can confirm having read the the rule set on that one yeah. yeah it's very light it's very like you know you only have one die the rules are very much like you have points and you spend those points on abilities and it's, it feels very kinetic it feels very fourth edition D D. it feels kind of like a video game mm-hmm. um and like I found that quest is a really great pick up and play one shot game. Um, it's really hard for long play. Um, you can do it for long play. It's just there's it's just, it's just a little bit more GM heavy than it is player heavy. Um, it's one of those games where the GM is going to need to do a lot of creative lift um, and like performance lift to play these games or to play in, mm-hmm. in this world. But I do think that in terms of like doing like one shot, um, it's so simple that like, you know, you can really get people going really quickly. You know, like I ran a one shot with this recently and, you know, we had everyone up with their characters within 45 minutes and we ran the one shot and finished it in like a day, which or, or in a few hours, which is like, you know, there's always the joke that one shots are never just one session. Um, yeah. So I th- I think that like I think Quest really lends itself to that. It's also like a really I would call it more sword and science um than I would fantasy RPG. 
Yeah. Um, there's a lot of like futuristic sci-fi elements. I know that they're working on a sci-fi supplement um, that's supposed to be coming out at some point. Um, but it definitely feels more like Flash Gordon or Star Wars to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really enjoy that part of the game. It feels very fluid in that regard. I don't have to be bound by any sort of traditional fantasy setting. Um, and the best part about it is that like, I think like the other best part about some of these games that we're talking about, Dane, is that a lot of them are free or like pay what you want. Right. True. And I think like that's something that like if you can't afford the like $80 or $100 to get all the D&D books, then this is a really great way to start playing tabletop games. Um, and I'll, yeah, and usually the rule books are really short and really simple to read. True. Um, and True. so it's like it's not as dense and. It, it, and it's something that like I've personally found as a game master, the best part about the hardest part for me game mastering is when everyone else knows the rules um, and can like rules lawyer me because um, <laughs> I really dislike rules in like tabletop games. I sometimes I'm willing to throw them out for the sake of the narrative and D and D is not conducive to that um, quest. On the other hand has so few rules that I actually have to create rules um, mm-hmm. because there's so few rules that I, I don't know what to do, um, which is maybe for me, it's not the best thing, but for other people, I think that's a really great thing. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy quest. I've had a good time with it. Um, it's very strange, very colorful. Uh, yeah. The next game is a game that I have yet to play, but I have prepared to play and I've been dying to play. But it is Honey Heist by Grant Howitt. Oh, I have played Honey Heist. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. From all the playthroughs I've listened to it, it just seems like a real romp and a real ball and a real just like everyone's caffeinated and just screaming. And it just seems like a really easy game that like has such a ridiculous premise that like everyone can kind of get into it and kind of have fun with it absolutely yeah no 10 out of 10 for honey heist and honey heist is free yes um i I do want to really quick go back and say um you can find a free version of our mundane supernatural life but i would recommend the the paid version it comes in a really pretty box and has everything you need um does the traveled road i believe is somewhere around ten dollars uh i think um beam saber is similar beam saber is kind of a long book though um Mm -hmm. fair warning and there's a digital version of fall of magic that's pretty affordable however you're missing out on a lot because the big part of it is it comes with this canvas screen printed scroll by that's like printed by hand um and that is amazing on the other hand it is like 90 dollars. so there you go yeah. Um, real quick, Quest, the digital base book is, is is free. So you can download that for free. And then the uh, supplements for PDF for like monsters and treasure, those are like $15 for PDFs. You can get physical copies of all three of the books for sub $30 each. I do recommend. They're beautifully printed books and they're in a really nice, easy to read font. Um, and also if you're into cards, they have a lot of like decks so you can have like little cards on little stands for minis and stuff nice um, that you can buy, which is fun. Um, and then, yeah, Honey Heist is is, is free. It's, it's name your own price. Um, and we'll have links to all of these in the description of the episode. Um, but yeah, real quick, the premise of Honey Heist is there's there, the plot from the from the itch.io page is one, you have a complex plan that requires precise timing. Two, you're a goddamn bear. And basically, you have to heist honey out of Honeycon or somewhere can be mm-hmm. anywhere. And you are a bear. You pick a you like pick your kind of bear, and then you pick you roll a d8 for a hat, and then you have two skills. It's criminal and bear, and you're basically just like trying to be find the balance between being a bear and being a criminal. Criminal. <laughs> um, and, yeah. And each and, and if you go one way or the other, there's consequences, which I think is really fun. Mm-hmm. Um. And yeah, it's a lot of improv and it's just, it's so silly, but also could be a lot of fun. You could do a whole fast saga of Honey Heist games, I'm sure. Um, oh, yes. But it's yeah. Hilarious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then my last game um, is Masks. Um, 
a mm. new generation. I think mm. I was contemplating throwing up Mecha Hack, but because you put Beam Saber, I think like Mecha Hack and Beam Saber kind of occupy the same space in my mind. And I realized Masks mm -hmm. is a game that I have played and I've gotten a, a I've had a really great time with. And it's fun because like even though like I don't know, I feel like the superhero craze is definitely starting to maybe it's not starting to wane, but it is shifting in the public eye, I feel. But mm -hmm. masks, I think, really it brings you back to like watching Teen Titans or like and stuff yeah. like that. And it's just a lot of fun because you play like basically like like not professional heroes, like teenagers typically who are super trying to be superheroes and trying to make sense of a world where they have powers and stuff. And, you know, yeah. it's it's powered by the apocalypse. So it's really easy to kind of hop into if you know those systems. Mm -hmm. And the game is very relationship based. Like there is no there are no hit points. You don't take damage. Um, no, you don't solve problems by killing people, which is great. You solve problems by being a hero and like doing the right thing. And it's very idealistic in that way um mm -hmm. and i think what's fun is that like because it what i loved about masks was that it was so keen on telling you like remember these are comic books and these are comic book adventures like structure your game like issues and have panels and you know move to the next scene and like have text but like they describe things as if it were a comic book and like yeah that kind of like literature that they give you really um in my opinion, like really helped me as a game master, like, um, uh, like kind of, uh, uh, I guess like, uh, run a right smooth, headspace. Yeah. Get in the right headspace and run a smooth game. Cause like I, when I, when I started GMing masks, I hadn't GM'd D and D in over two or three years. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I still haven't like run a full D and D game. Uh, with any, with much or any success and I think like playing masks and really doing like a pretty like robust story and like with a full cast and like really digging into like every character's relationship to one another and like their relationship to other NPCs and like really fleshing out like a really fun world and like and a story I think it like really couldn't have been a better GMing experience to kind of get back in the chair mm -hmm. um, and behind the screen. And I think like the nice part about masks is that like you can kind of structure each arc as like an arc or like a, or like a, or like a volume of comics. And yeah. so you can always give your players closure, um, which is really fun. And like, who doesn't want to be a superhero? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think one of the hardest, we should do an episode about this, which is one of the hardest things in the world is to actually do a whole campaign of a tabletop RPG. Yeah. Um, that is, that is a challenge. It is a challenge to do it all, let alone do well. Yeah. Um, and I would love to talk about that. Um, so, and so the fact that masks does give tools that help with that stupendous. And also the fact that they give advice on framing narratives and stuff using saying, talk about panels, talk about word bubbles, right? Like, um, I think I, I've, I've played in red masks. I think they mentioned thought bubbles too, that like, that's yes. an option as a player. And I was like, Oh, that's dope. Um, quick shout out to, um, another game that I'm, that just came out, um, that does something similar. Uh, is a game called Fight with Spirit. It's by the oh, same yeah. people who do who did Armand Day and Supernatural Life, actually. Um, and I've only played uh, the uh, a very early alpha playtest version um, of that of that game. Um, but even back then, and I and I in, in getting the the official version, it's still in there. Um, is like they ask you to do it's an anime sports tabletop rpg um of all things it's amazing um and the funny thing is like they have uh a structure they they teach they show you how to structure the episode um and like there are specific stages you're supposed to hit to play the game and some of them the first and last are to describe the anime intro and the anime outro <laughs> um and they describe that like you should do it the same and if you don't you should impl you should explain why like you've changed seasons 
you know, like, um, mm. and I'm like, that's dope. Like, I think more games should do stuff like that because in 5e, there's not a lot of advice for GMs on like, how do you frame this? Like, how do you, do you, should you talk about it like a movie? Should you do, is it, is it supposed to be more akin to a book somehow? Like, what are you supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Um, and you're right. Masks does an amazing job of being like, no, no, no. Think like comic books. So talk about what's in the panel. You know, are there sound effects, right? Like, what are you going to do? And that's great. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Uh, I would say like all three of these games... I really enjoy, and I'm I I I know you've talked about our mundane supernatural life. Um, I fucking love that game so much. I feel like <laughs> I feel like that game would make a great web tune. <laughs> oh, we, I kind of. I'm okay. Um, we should. Okay, so here's so here's the fun thing. We're gonna put links to these games in the description, um, and Derek, Derek will uh, I will will I will help you do this um, to make sure you get the right ones. But I have played Fall of Magic, Dust of the Tra Traveled Road, Our Mundane Supernatural Life, um, Beam Saber. I haven't played Quest or I did play Honey Heist, but those episodes are kind of gone um, or Masks on Air. But I can I have for my old shows for yeah, I, for examples, if you if listeners want to hear these specific some of these specific games played how they kind of come to life yeah maybe like um, the first episode of each of those exactly arcs. Yeah. yeah that'd be great to have those links yeah. yeah so look forward to that um but i think that i think that about does it for yeah. for this episode yeah that was a pretty solid classic tier episode that we've done yeah um it's been a minute even, it's but yeah it really has it really has this every other week thing we've been doing has been great for like time and like mm -hmm. editing and having time to munch on things but it's been super weird in terms of like like oh yeah we haven't done that in a while in terms of like an episode style or topic and also yeah. like what you were saying at the top of the episode of when is this gonna air i it's like it's like yeah like i i don't i don't even know like i have a spreadsheet that i can look at and, and say when this is supposed to air like this is supposed to air on june 21st 2023 right so um, i'll have been i'll have been done with finals for like almost a month and a half <laughs> yeah and so but here's the thing that might not happen <laughs> like like true i could miss another week or two again so i guess we'll see what happens um mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. uh <laughs> um well good stuff man uh enjoy the rest of your days off before work starts. Um, and I think yeah. next time we catch up will be after you've started work. So absolutely. So I'll, yeah. I'm sure I, I will, I will blow through that one minute for real <laughs> that time. I bet you anything. Sounds good, dude. Mm -hmm. All right. Have a good rest of your Sunday. Yeah, you too. And to all of you listening, even if it isn't Sunday, I hope your day is going well. And if not, I hope it gets better. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Out here on the sand Not far from land Sure, I'm warm But I wish I was cold with you Out here on the sand Oh.